Hey everyone, tonight I'll be giving a rundown of a few interesting areas that remain close to the public, up until the present. I aim to look for some places that remain out of the public eye, so comparatively well-known places such as Area 51 won't be in this video. Hopefully you'll enjoy the video. Hell Gate was once a dangerous whirlpool that earned its name from the many ships that were caught in its orbit, destroyed, and then deposited alongside the narrow passage near the whirlpool. It's located in the vicinity of the mainland Bronx area and Rikers Island. A pair of islands, the North Brother and South Brother Islands, sit near the place where the whirlpool once caused havoc. The islands were first catalogued by Europeans in the 1600s, when a Dutch trading company surveyed the islands and gave them the title, The Companions. It was given to the British close to the turn of the 18th century, who in turn granted it to a settler by the name of James Graham. He wasn't impressed with the land provided for a settlement, citing the dangerous water phenomena in the area and left the pair of islands abandoned. North Brother Island is the focus of our story, and is one of the more commonly known restricted areas in this video. Despite this, it still remains relatively obscure in the grand history of New York City. In 1869, a lighthouse was built, and outside of a small obelisk that was erected in the interim, it remained uninhabited until 1885. The Riverside Hospital was built on the island, a site that served as a place where patients with particularly deadly and or contagious diseases could easily be kept away from the public. Facilities were moved from Blackwell Island to this area. Smallpox was a big threat at the time of its founding, but Riverside took patients afflicted by tuberculosis, typhoid, and polio, along with others. A couple of notable tragic events occurred during this time frame. In 1904, a steamship was wrecked on the island shore, with over 1,021 casualties. In 1907, the infamous Typhoid Mary, real name Mary Mallon, was forcibly quarantined after she was found to have been a host for typhoid. She remained there until 1909 at Riverside, successfully petitioning for release under the conditions that she became a domestic worker and avoided working as a cook. Malin was forcibly quarantined again in 1915 when she was found working as a cook under an assumed name against the agreement. 25 people had died from typhoid contracted from her during her employment. She lived on North Brother Island until her passing in 1938. The hospital began to become dilapidated in the midst of the 20th century. It remained in this state for a significant period of time, but was later restored in 1943, as a tuberculosis epidemic spread throughout the state. By the time it neared completion, the threat had become far less prevalent, so the hospital was later used to house veterans in transit from Europe after the end of the war and even saw service as a juvenile detention facility. In the 1950s, the site became a rehabilitation center for teenage addicts, and was later closed in 1963, after multiple staff were found guilty on charges of corruption. The island was abandoned after this point, and subsequent mayors decided to let it be. Today, it's a bird refuge. Access is prohibited to the public, and even if permission is given, visitors must be escorted through the area by a NYC Park staffer. The island has been the site of some morally questionable decisions from the city authorities in the past, as many were forcibly taken from their homes and placed at Riverside to prevent disease vectors from occurring in the city. Now it lies relatively unnoticed today, mostly left to the wildlife. <laughs> Dolce, New Mexico, is a town of 2,743 people 
that lies close to the state line with Colorado. The town's name translates to sweet. While it remains a rumor, it's said that a military site is somewhere north of the town in a mountainside in close proximity to the Archuleta Mesa. While its existence remains unconfirmed, the area has been a hotbed for UFO sightings in a state that has had many extraterrestrial phenomena reported throughout the years. Containing seven below ground levels that drop down deep into the soil beneath the mesa, this base has remained a relatively popular site in the UFO community. Its existence remains unconfirmed, but rumors pervade. Some former law enforcement members have made interesting claims in the past about this area. Gabe Valdez was a state trooper who worked in the area beginning in the 1970s. Throughout his tenure, he responded to multiple reports of cattle mutilations. Similar to some other cattle mutilation reports from many parts of the U.S. countryside, he found the dead cattle's organs removed with surgical precision and the corpses often had no blood around their incisions. Selected parts of the cow had been removed, and there were no signs of struggle. Ranchers in the area continued to attribute these cases to something that was clearly not a natural predator. UFO events were often recorded near these places in the days leading up to a cattle mutilation. Valdez began to do more research and soon found that this section of northern New Mexico and eastern Colorado was a hot spot for cattle mutilations. In fact, the first widely publicized mutilation occurred in Alamosa, Colorado, about 103 miles northeast. A horse was found dead, with the flesh stripped from its head and neck area, and multiple precise cuts had been made along its body. This gruesome spectacle gained national attention as the wounds had been cauterized and no blood was near the incisions. Valdez continued to record his encounters with UFOs and mutilated creatures. He said in a later interview that he often found military equipment, such as glow sticks or gas masks, in the vicinity of these incidents. Valdez also believed that many of the UFOs were military rather than extraterrestrial in nature, and that the mutilated animals were placed there by military personnel to confuse the locals. Valdez even suggested that a military facility was in the vicinity of Dolce. Other accounts from friends of Valdez suggested that a joint U.S. alien base was related to the phenomena seen by people in the area. A guy named Paul Benowitz was the owner of a small tech company outside of the perimeter of the Kirkland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. In the 1980s, he filmed and reported strange lights over the base to the Air Force officers who he knew, and even claimed that he was picking up signals that were extraterrestrial in origin on his home radio. An Air Force intelligence officer named Richard Doty contacted Benowitz allegedly told to cover up what the Air Force was doing with fabricated material, Doty did a little trolling and told Benowitz that the U.S. was working with aliens in a hidden subterranean base under the Archuleta Mesa. Authors who have written on the three men, Doty, Benowitz, and Valdez, tend to infer that Doty simply fed Benowitz this story to cover up some sort of U.S. weapons program. The Cold War was ongoing at the time, and the U.S. wanted to preserve its secrets from the prying eyes of the Russians. Others have suggested that Doty was simply channeling Zinch and entertaining himself at the expense of others. In the end, these three men ended up becoming close friends, and Doty became a local cop in the Dolce area. The men continued to speculate on what exactly was going on, in a series of interviews that occurred before he passed away in 2011, Valdez disclosed his opinions on the local phenomena, a big chunk of which I covered earlier. He also talked about his encounter with a creature that was inside of a dead cow. It was a fetus, but for something that clearly wasn't a cow. 
described it as having a boneless head, and features that reminded him of a human, a monkey, and a frog. Valdez wasn't sure what to make of that, as he continued to believe that the government was causing the cattle mutilations throughout the area. Personally, I wouldn't be too surprised if many of these cases were tied into cult activity. In the area where I live, we've had multiple cases of cattle mutilation in the past, and many of the older people in my town believe them to be related to cult activity. There might be separate reasons between regions, but the nature of these incisions and the lack of blood and or reproductive organs ties nicely into multiple beliefs held by some popular cults throughout the ages. You could easily argue that a lot of that ties into the constant fear of Satanist cults throughout the 70s and 80s as well. Either way, this particular aspect of Dolce is one of the most interesting ongoing stories surrounding the area. The stories surrounding the town don't end there. There's the tale that aliens killed 67 people in the Yucarilla Apache Reservation. Philip Schneider is an interesting figure in a community of interesting people. Born in 1947 to a military family, he gained media attention when he began claiming that he had been an engineer that had assisted in constructing underground military bases throughout the US. He also claimed that his dad was involved with the Philadelphia Experiment, a conspiracy that I covered in my World War II iceberg. It's pretty easy to find information online about that particular event, if you haven't heard from it before. In essence, Schneider was a figure who generated a lot of controversy from his claims. Some see him as a whistleblower who was taken out by some shadowy government agency, while others see him as a man who sought attention. Schneider claimed that while he worked as an explosive engineer for the government, he had helped with the construction of the Dolce base. While information on him was difficult to obtain, Schneider did work for the Morrison Nudson Civil Engineering Company and served in the Army Corps of Engineers. Schneider went on to say that in 1979, he was consulting with the other engineers and discussing what level of explosive was necessary to clear out the tunnels that would form the backbone of the new military complex. Special forces were present at the work site, which roused the explosive engineers' curiosity. The engineers continued their work and cleared out new tunnels with repeated detonations. While the work continued, a group of workers exploring a cleared out tunnel accidentally stumbled upon an underground cavern that was a hidden base for a group of aliens. The resulting firefight between the military and the aliens left 67 men dead. Philip Schneider claimed that he was one of only three men who had survived the encounter, and that he had received scars from the strange alien weaponry used during the conflict. According to him, the battle in the complex continues today. At other points, he has claimed that 25% of the US GDP goes to shadowy organizations dedicated to fighting the extraterrestrial threat and multiple countries have banded together to form a united covert front for defense against the invaders. I would call this group the, the final story I'll share with you today out of the surprisingly deep well of Dolce in North New Mexico in South Colorado weirdness is this little declassified CIA report I discovered while trawling information about cattle mutilations in the area. It's related to Project Sunstreak, a program that sought to harness psychics and use the phenomena associated with them for information gathering purposes. This isn't a conspiracy. Multiple CIA documents released to the public give accounts about what they intended to do. The program began in the 1970s and continued for decades. Anyway, in one session in 1988, the CIA was in the process of working with a trainee in the program. The file this story comes from is titled Project 210, Session 1, RV, meaning remote viewing. I've left a link to it below the video. There's a summary of the event in the file, 
a newspaper clipping, and a description of the actual event. Here's the description. The way it ties into the conspiracy theories is quite interesting. Site was a flat, low, open, dry, warm, rocky, bleak area, like Nevada, at night. The site consisted of a circular marked area. Associated with the site was the feeling of bad air, contamination, energetics, and radiation. Circle of Death Loud machine noises were present, as were a group of men who were waiting to do something orchestrated or planned. They started closing in on something, and each man was doing something. Lots of excited motion. They were scurrying, preparing, measuring. What they were doing caused strong AIs of queasiness. That means the person who's undergoing this thing, and the feeling that what was going on was very bad. What was induced in the circular marked area is what caused the death. Associated with the word death were the concepts of the marked area, accidental this time, induced, scientific, and unnatural, AOL, chemical weapons slash military. The men were not from the immediate area, they were from at least 50 to 100 miles away. The sound came from on low, rectangular, fenced buildings near hills. The buildings had more floors than visible, with the eye, underground floors. Associated with the building was a strong sense of security, secrecy, hiding, and illegal activities. AOLs generated by the building were chem biowarfare, helicopter, military base, scientists, and the nuclear radiation symbol. That's it for that particular rabbit hole. What are your thoughts on this whole deal? I'm mixed as to what exactly occurred. If you ever find yourself in that part of New Mexico, you can go on top of the mesa outside the town and even get an excellent view of the area from an old fire tower. However, if there's a grain of truth in these stories, you might be right near a base that you will most likely never be able to access. The Ai's Grand Shrine remains one of the most popular pilgrimage sites in Japan. The story of the shrine is said to have begun 2,000 years before present day. The 11th Emperor of Japan asked his daughter to find a location where the relics of the sun deity, Amaratsu, could be preserved and worship of the goddess could be conducted for years to come. Amaratsu was a crucial part of the Japanese pantheon, an embodiment of the nation itself, and was the empress of the kami, the gods of good and evil in Japanese folklore. Think along the lines of Zeus or Odin. The imperial family claims lineage from her. The princess continued on her quest for two decades, and she crisscrossed Japan in search of a place where the goddess could dwell perpetually. As she traveled through where present-day Ice City lies, the goddess spoke to her and told her that this land was fit for her to live. The princess said that the goddess spoke the following words, The province of ice, of the divine wind, is the land whither repair the successive waves from the eternal world. It is a secluded and pleasant land. In this land I wish to dwell. The princess set up 50 bells to mark the spot. She served as the priestess for the temple, a position that has been maintained by unmarried women in the imperial bloodline ever since. The shrine was constructed and became known as the Inner Shrine, as another structure known as the Outer Shrine was built roughly four miles away a few centuries later. The whole structure was called the Grand Shrine, Pilgrimages to the site became commonplace for people from all parts of Japan, and by the 18th century, millions visited the place of reverence annually. Today, it's made out of 125 shrines sprinkled throughout the site, with the inner and outer shrines being the epicenter of the pilgrimages. The only one of these buildings in the internal part of the temple, open to the public, is a small shop where charms and blessings can be purchased. The other buildings serve a variety of functions for religious ceremonies. Some interesting aspects of the park 
that stuck out to me when I looked into this particular temple were the Uji Bridge and a few exterior buildings throughout the temple. The Uji Bridge is rebuilt every 20 years in an action that recalls the Shinto religion's views on the cycles of death, renewal, and flux. As a person who's experienced a massive amount of change throughout my life, I've moved 15 times in 15 years, I found some aspects of their core doctrine very compelling. A small temple in the complex is the dwelling place of a pair of wind spirits said to have created the typhoons that obliterated a 13th century Mongol fleet that attempted to invade Japan. The bark of several trees in the area have been worn down to a smooth finish by the millions of people who have run their hands over their trunks, hoping to receive some strength from the ancient trees. There's a lot of other aspects of this shrine that fascinate me, but I'll leave this part of the video at that. I enjoyed the history behind this particular place immensely. Expect a video about various interesting Japanese places sometime in the future. Aksum is an ancient city that lies at 7,000 feet above sea level. It's in northern Ethiopia and was once a center for a vibrant Christian culture. Tradition holds that a king in the 4th century AD adopted Christianity, encouraging many others to join the faith as well. Legends from the 1300s Ethiopian national epic, The Glory of Kings, tell that the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Aksum by the son of a supposed union between the Israelite King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. The Ark remained in the Church of Our Lady of Zion, also known as the Chapel of the Tablet. The chapel was renovated many times in the intervening years between the 4th century and present day, with the latest major restructuring of the architecture occurring in the 1950s. The Ark is said to have remained in place for most of that time, briefly being hidden in the 16th century to keep it from invading Islamic armies before it was returned to the church. The chapel remains closed to the public with a sole guardian appointed to oversee its protection. One story I read claimed that the renovations to the church have been due to the power of the Ark slowly destroying the building, but I'd take that with a grain of salt and light. If you'd like to cosplay as a Warhammer 40k custodian, guarding the Emperor, or a member of the Adeptus Astronomica, you will need to be a virgin and be appointed by the previous guardian of the chapel. Mezgor, pronounced Mezgorye, although I kind of like the sound of Mezgor, sounds pretty metal, is said by some to be roughly equivalent to Area 51 and similar secret sites throughout the world, although it's relatively under the radar compared to some of the stories about the Moscow restricted metro tunnels. It's a town close to the public, it is deep within Bashkortostan province in the southern Ural Mountains. It gained attention in the international security community in the 1990s when satellite imagery showed evidence of major excavations and construction activity. The activity tapered off in 2002, and it appeared that the government had finished work. This entire project was named Mount Yamanatau after the primary place where the activity was centered. The veil of secrecy has been effective as the site's purpose still remains undisclosed to present day. It's speculated to be a nuclear base or shelter for government personnel, although the Kremlin already has a base somewhere in the Moscow metro. The mountain and the surrounding town continue to keep their restricted status for the time being. The place isn't some abandoned relic from the Cold War. It is still serving some function. On a parting note, there's an interesting story that involves the former U.S. Pennsylvania representative, Kurt Weldon. He became interested in the story of the Mezgorye base when it was first observed on satellite imaging. And while he was in Russia, he took the opportunity 
to ask one of his Russian contacts about the site. Weldon talked to the deputy interior minister, a man who had supervision over Russia's mining interests, and asked him what he knew. The man shook his head and said that he had never heard anything about what was happening there. The minister was willing to check, so he sent out an aide to go look up information on any activities involving the town. A significant portion of time passed. The aide returned to the office, visibly distressed, and said that he was not permitted to say anything about it. Take that story for what you will. And with that, I'll bring this video to a close. Thank you for watching this far. I'll see you soon.